148. What we find in Scripture is that uh, it is essential as a Christian to worship the Lord. And uh, we've had a lot of discussions about what it means to worship. And sometimes we think of it synonymous with praise. Uh, pra uh, praise is ushered in by worship. But worship is uh, our natural response to who God is. Uh, our appropriate response to who God is. Uh, remember, we don't even know how to worship Him properly unless He has shown us how to do this. And He shows us how to do this through His Word. We find the law that brings us into the right attitude. We find His uh, uh, the the description of his hand and how powerful he is and how he's the creator of all things and how even to the smallest things, even to to you, how he predestinated before the before the foundations of the world. All these things go into our appropriate response to God. We even see that what we consider to be inanimate objects have a place in worshiping God. The rocks and the trees, trees are living, but a rock or even water, uh, things like that are mentioned in Scripture as worshiping God and glorifying God. So let's look in uh, Psalms 148, let's look for some of these things, and let's ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for worship. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, praise Him in the heights, praise ye Him, all His angels, praise ye Him, all His hosts, praise ye Him, sun and moon, praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded that they were created. He hath established them forever and ever, and he hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons in all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, praise young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above all the earth and heaven, he hath exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near him, near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. And I just get so excited when I read that passage and I have to hang on to this pulpit because I just feel like I'm going to get crazy here. But it's, it's really a, a wonderful, wonderful call to praise the Lord. And did you notice the inanimate objects, these things that we talk about, the moon, is the moon alive? Does it have a soul? Stars? No. Waters? The deep? No. But everything was created for His purpose. Everything has a proper response. It is what it is to glorify Him. We are what we are to glorify Him. And that's how we praise the Lord, and that's how we worship the Lord. So let's, let's praise the Lord now through song. And turn in your hymnals, and let's start with number 52 in your hymnals. Please stand with me. And let's praise the Lord. Oh 
Father's world <coughs> is created for him, His purposes to bring His glory. <laughs> Thank you. 
to 65, the song right next to that.
Joseph. Every special you play becomes my all-time favorite. I think it's awesome. Well, welcome everybody. It's a special day for us today. A lot of you knew Dave before they, they blasted off. He, he and Judy were here. They say they've been gone six years. I can hardly believe that. It feels like 50. <laughs> so, and it's awesome to have you back. Just awesome. They're a very special couple. Uh, we're going to take as much use of them as we can while they're here. Wednesday night during our eating time, they are going to field questions about their ministry in, um, right at the foot of the Twin Towers. They were there running a mission when the things went collapsed on the ground. And uh, awesome, awesome experience there. They saw some things uh, that people did for each other that are just really heartwarming and, and very moving. So they're, they're open to any questions you want to ask them about that. And, uh, and also, uh, many of you know that they spent, uh, was it 12 years in Africa? Something like that? How many? 10, 11. Okay, 11 years in Africa. And that's where Rodney Kastner comes in. The same mission, and uh, he will be here with us next week. So I think that's pretty awesome. So they are Zoom members here all the time. So when you, when you, when it's, like, it's just really important that we make connections for them and for you. Because Dave and Judy are prayer warriors, and uh, as they get a picture of the church in their mind, their prayer ops tempo is to just go row to row to row and, and pray for everybody here in this room. I think it's pretty awesome. So I tried to make some notes that um, would be coherent here to convey what they mean to us, but I failed. Um, they're longtime friends to us and to our church, but more than friends. Uh, they're, they're our confidants, they are our counselors when we need the counselors. Dave and I have talked many things over out of the Word of God. Uh, it's just been awesome. They love the Word and they work very hard to treat it right, which is inspirational to me. There's a few guys that are inspired, that have inspired me in the ministry. And, uh, and those are the ones that walked away from everything the world could offer and gave it all to the Lord. Now, Dave is a brilliant man, and Judy is, she's a brilliant woman in her own right. They could have gone on to have everything this world had to offer. They swapped it away for what they could do to serve the Lord. To me, that's awe-inspiring. So those are the kind of people I gravitate to because of that. Uh, like I say, they've been a confidant to us in times of trouble. They give us counsel and wisdom when it's needed, and uh, which is often. Uh, they've been a dedicated servant all around the world. And, and they were a dedicated servant when the world came to us on 9-11. They were there. So... The one time, I was an old guy already by then and, and had retired from the military after 26 years. And that was the one time I wished I could put the uniform back on. Uh, but they were there uh, in the Lord's uniform serving him, uh, doing many special things. So now I've asked Dave to break the word with us today. And uh, Dave, if you come forward and, and do that for us. So... We'll be praying for you, Dave, as you minister to us. And thank you very much, brother. Don't get too emotional. I don't get emotional. Okay. You know that. I just get fired up. So. Oh, and we have, amongst the audience, we have rented sinners here for you today. One in particular that, uh, that you can target if you need to. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Right, Roxanne? That's right. I'll see my bill tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I, uh, you know, what's really great to see is the number of rows of seats that you have. Now, that's more than what we, what we remember. And I think, what, is that the seat you've always had, Kristen? <laughs> We've let her move up a couple huh? of rows. You see that? We've let her move up a couple. I've gotten to meet some of you. Um, we, we moved from here to North Carolina. We're closer 
to our daughter and uh, her husband and also her family there. Uh, there's something about daughters. Uh, when you get to be an old person, you kind of gravitate toward your daughter uh, because we're expecting that she will take good care of us. <laughs> what? Are you a... Uh, That's our daughter, right behind us. Yeah, I know. Well, are you, are you close enough? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we moved to North Carolina. We live in Statesville, North Carolina, which if you have any concept of geography at all, it is kind of in the center west part of the state right where I-40 and I-77 intersect. If you're familiar with that at all, well, Craig, you know about that place. Don't you? Mm, no, I don't. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I am too. With I'm my truck, I don't go past the, the, basically the Mississippi. Oh, okay. Now, my other truck, my driver, yeah, is okay. all over. Okay. But I don't. He hauls in and out of North Carolina a lot. Well, uh, North Carolina is a nice place. And, uh, and you're liable to see a number of different number of different things uh, in North Carolina. Um, I'm reminded of one story where a fellow was uh, following a truck uh, full of pigs down I-40, and he was headed he was headed east, as I recall, and. Uh, and he was not too far behind, but all of a sudden the gate opened up at the back of the truck and a pig fell out on the road and kind of skipped along the road there, you know, and he, he stopped and he, he got to pick the pig up and must be some kind of guy. He picked the pig up and put the pig in the seat next to him. And uh, in the meantime, uh, the truck had headed on down the road, never stopped or anything. And so there, there was the truck way down the road, and the, I thought, well, I've got to get this pig to that truck. And so he hurried down the road at, uh, well, he did exceed the speed limit. And it wasn't long before he had those little blue lights in his rearview mirror. And so he pulled over, and the, the state trooper came over and looked in the window and he saw this pig sitting in the passenger seat over here and uh, he asked the driver what he was doing with that pig and the driver said well I was trying to catch the truck uh, there was a truck full of pigs and I was trying to catch him and the state trooper said well you know you're not going to catch him he's too far down the road you're not going to catch him but what I would like for you to do is to take this pig to the zoo and leave it. Take the pig to the zoo. Do you have that, sir? And yes, yes, officer, I will. I will take the pig to the zoo. And so the patrolman got into his uh, cruiser and went on down the road. And the ne very next day, as he was doing one of his rounds on, on I-40 there, headed east, he came across the very spot yesterday where he had stopped that dog. With pig. And here was the same car. And the fellow was in the car, and seated beside him was the pig. And so he stopped and he got out and he went over and he looked in and he said, He said, Is that the same pig? He says, Yes, officer, it is. He said, I thought I told you to take that pig to the zoo. And the driver said, Well, officer, we did. And we had such a good time, we're going to the beach today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a lady in my Sunday school class who give me a C plus. Uh, but I am very pleased to be here with you and get to meet those I've not met before. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about something which is, has been really impressed on my heart over the past uh, four or five years, as uh, I have had occasion to teach from different passages of Scripture, 
uh, in the course of our time there in, in North Carolina. Uh, one, one passage of scripture that I think is, is very important is uh, that found in, in um, Romans, chapter, Romans chapter 6. So if you have Romans chapter 6, get out your phone. Uh, turn with me in your phone. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, good. Good, to see, good to see all those phones. You know, the only thing I, you need to have an app that, that, that puts the sound of pages turning. <laughs> all right, so Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. Just don't. Romans 1, very familiar verse, uh, I'm sure, to most of you, and that's verse 16 of Romans 1. And Paul, writing to the Romans, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to, every, to, to salvation, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Now what's interesting about this verse is that not only is it used in personal evangelism, uh, it's used in a number of other ways as well, but I wanted you to notice this verse, this word, salvation. <laughs> if we were to look this word up in a concordance or a Bible dictionary, the term salvation also means what? Salvation. Another term for salvation would be? What? Deliverance. Deliverance, yes, that's it, deliverance. And, uh, and so what the apostle is saying here, that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to deliverance for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This idea of being delivered from something, and in this particular context, to being delivered from sin is really important in this epistle to the Romans. And when you read a verse like this in this particular context, you, you come to the conclusion that this verse was not written just for unbelievers. And this verse is not just for doing personal evangelism. For the Apostle Paul, he is saying that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to deliverance. From what? From what is he looking for deliverance? Well, yes, sin. He's looking for deliverance from sin. Why would he be looking for that? Well, one reason, of course, is that uh, is that if you if you persist in sinning, what does God do? Discipline. Hush. Yes. Another way of saying is of saying it is that God spanks His children when they are disobedient. In theological circles, they call this, um, I forget what they call this. You remember, Judy? What the, uh, they call this, huh? Chastisement. It could be chastisement. Yeah, it could be chastisement. Uh, it's, it's temporal, temporal punishment as opposed to eternal punishment. Does that make sense to you? Yes. It's temporal punishment. And so when the apostle is writing this epistle, he has in mind giving us the information we need so that we can escape temporal punishment. So when he writes here that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, he's saying it is the power of God to deliver me from temporal chastisement. The gospel is given to us not only to give us eternal life in heaven one day when we die, but it, it's given to us so that we have freedom from sin. Uh, 
I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out. But that's right here. Let me, let me read something else to you here, for you here. This is uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Uh, I'm going to be reading from verse 4 of Romans 6. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now you see where he's going with this. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. In other words, Paul is saying, for the one who believes in the Lord Jesus, as his personal savior, has the opportunity now to live what kind of life? Holy. Holy life. We so shall be, yes, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, exhibiting resurrected life now. Let's read on here. Uh, <clears throat> For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Wow. Here he is. He has... <coughs> He has suffered on the cross in our behalf to purchase eternal life for everyone who believes. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. But he's given us the opportunity to have eternal life. That's part of it. But he also says here in verse 6, he, he was crucified that our old... And knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. I want you to think about this. We see salvation as escape from hell. And what Paul is suggesting to us, we have salvation because on the cross, Christ dealt a death blow to the old nature. Amen. I don't mean to say that we are sinlessly perfect, nor do I mean to imply at all that this old man is, is absolutely gone, because we struggle with it every day. But it has been judged so that we can live lives that are pleasing to him. So when Paul says in chapter 1 of the book of Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for deliverance, He's talking about the death blow that has been dealt against the old nature, the old sinful nature that has so characterized me for so many years. I want, I want you to think about this even further when we read uh, Romans chapter 8. Here in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation, Paul writes, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Just, just to help us here, just a bit. This word condemnation has occurred once before in chapter 5. Now it occurs here in chapter 8, and Paul tells us there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Need a different marker, Dave. Well, you can't see that? <laughs> I can barely, but I'm sure there's others that can't. Okay. <laughs> you go to five. Always a smart aleck. What? You go to five. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Just trying to help you out. I need to get my confidence back. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Rick. <Vince. laughs> okay. Do I need to rewrite this? No. Condemnation? Okay. 
Is this better? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bell is the keeper of the markers? That's yeah, okay. That's okay. There's more than one in there. <laughs> okay. Now, actually, what this word, the, the translation of the Greek word into condemnation is somewhat misleading. And I say that, I say that carefully because the translators did a really super job in translating the <laughs> The word condemnation says something else to you when actually what the word condemnation, how the word should be translated is this condemnation to be that's um, this is slavery. Slavery to sin servitude to sin. So what he is telling us in this passage of scripture is that those who are in Christ Jesus, there's therefore now no slavery to sin to those who are in, who are in Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought of that? that then he has, he has by his death on the cross not only purchased eternal life in heaven, but in this life now, he makes it possible to live in a way that is pleasing to the Lord Jesus. We have new life. Let's, let's read more here in uh, Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law couldn't provide us with the righteousness, the righteous living that we needed. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and he condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That the righteous demands of the righteous behavior, which is prescribed by the law, might with the power of the Spirit be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let me, let, let's read it. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Do not misunderstand what I am saying. I am not saying that we have been guaranteed a life of sinless perfection. There have some, been some people who have taught that. He's not telling us that at all. What he is telling us is that the, sin, the power of the sin nature in our lives has been broken. And that now, because we have the indwelling Spirit of God, the righteous behavior, which is prescribed by the law, the righteousness can be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It's too bad that in some translations, that particular phrase or clause is taken out of verse 1. And it's a, it's a problem for textual critics, uh, those who are, who are determined to find which text best represents the original. I think it's just too bad that, uh, that they have chosen to go with two, two minor texts in dumping that, that phrase in verse 1 of chapter 8, whereas the, the vast majority of Greek texts have this in 8.1, there is therefore now no slavery to sin to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now this isn't the only place where Paul deals with this particular issue. I want you to turn with me to, to Galatians 
chapter 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 5, uh, the apostle writes to the Galatians about their, their lack of godly behavior. And he tells them, indeed I, Paul, say to you, this is in verse 2, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You are, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. We, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, these Jewish rituals, uh, avails anything but faith, through uh, faith working through love. Now you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Well, then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut, them, cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now look at this verse. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now if you want to know what he was referring to, you can look over, well you can look down uh, <clears throat> to verse 17, and from verse 17, uh, through, uh, through verse 21, uh, you have a list of all of the behaviors that are prompted by the flesh. But what Paul is writing to the Galatians is that they are free from that. In fact, he says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now I happen to be in the bubble, as it's said here, when Pastor Terry taught us about this, this conjunction, who, may, who, may. These are two negative conjunctions that are placed together. In English, if we had uh, no, not put together, we would say the one cancels out the other and we change a, an otherwise negative statement to a positive statement. But in Greek language, when they put an ou me together, it is a very, very strong negative statement. And so when you look here at Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 16, you see here he is saying to us, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not under any circumstance fulfill the lust of the flesh. I remember teaching this to my Sunday school class. And my Sunday school class <clears throat> happens to be a class of octogenarians. I'm close. 80 year olds and they sat there and they listened to this and they mouthed the word impossible. impossible. It's not possible to live a life not sinless but free from the power of sin. Do you get the difference there? Not sinless but free from sin's power. 
as Paul wrote to the Galatians, he said, if you, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not, under any circumstance, fulfill the lust of the flesh. I had a, a young man who came into my office one day and he, he uh, said, I, I, I want you to help me. He said, I, I've been kicked out of my house. My, my wife has kicked me out. And I said, oh, I said, uh, why, why was that? Because uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't entirely sure he didn't deserve it. But I said, please uh, tell me what, what went on. And what was going on was that he was watching things on his phone that he shouldn't be looking at, and she found out. So she, uh, uh, she accepted him back into the house and it wasn't more than a week, 10 days later, he's back in my office and he's saying, I got kicked out and now I can't get back. And I said, you know, there was one way to avoid this. Don't do that. But you know, he had been trapped by this lustful behavior and he couldn't stop it. And he was not aware of the freedom that was now through Jesus Christ, his work on the cross, did not know about uh, uh, sorry, walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. I've talked to people that, uh, that I know and uh, some of you probably know others who are struggling with an anger problem. I did. <clears throat> struggling with anger. Anger could erupt at any moment. And uh, anger is one of the sins that come from, from fleshly lust. I had a friend in, in Siloam Springs, Arkansas, who was a clinical psychologist name was Shed McWilliams, not that that means anything to you, but he turned out to be a really good friend of mine. And we would meet every Tuesday morning at the local McDonald's, and we would talk about uh, what had taken place in our lives over the past week. And we had this greeting, which, well, you think about it. The first thing we said to each other was, are you clean? <clears throat> now if you, you know, I know guys probably picked up on this immediately, but this, this question, are you clean? But also there were questions that had to do with how life was going from the last time we'd seen each other, and the times of flying off the handle and getting angry, and, doing things that we shouldn't do because we got, we were just ticked off. I discovered that it was, it took exactly one sixty-fourth of a cent, of a second to go from cool calmness to intense rage, especially for people who had been practicing it for some time. Yes. I know about that. I know about that. Shed was very helpful because as a clinical psychologist, he knew something about the, the psychology of emotions. And he told me that, you know, anger, anger is a secondary emotion. What do you mean secondary? Well, it is in answer or in response to some other emotion. There are three, three basic primary emotions to which anger is usually a, a response. One is fear, the other is frustration, and the third one is hurt. If you're hurt by someone, it's very easy to supplant the hurt with anger. If you get suddenly cut off in traffic so that your knees are wobbling, 
That's fear. And it's easy to become full of road rage toward the driver that caused that problem. So anger, you know, is a secondary emotion. But it is one, it is one of the lusts of the flesh. And it's found in the list, the list here in Galatians chapter 5. And Paul says, are you struggling with that? The promise is, because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, you don't have to be a slave to that sin anymore. Thank you, Lord. Not anymore. We were talking around the table last evening, and we were looking at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And you probably can quote that by heart. That's the list of the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> and here it says, it's, it's this really, <laughs> an, an amazing statement. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And, and look at that, look at that last sentence. Against such there is no law. You know, I look at that and I say, you know, I can binge on any one of those behaviors and it'll be a good thing. Against such, there is no law. You know, it's a wonderful thing what the Lord Jesus did for us on the cross. He not only paid for our sin, and if we put our faith and trust in him, if we believe on him, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, if we believe that, and the Bible tells us we have eternal life. But in these scriptures that we have read this morning, it's even better than that. And that is that he's given to you and to me through his death on the cross. Freedom from slavery. Sin. Yes. And when the temptation comes and I hear somebody whispering in my ear, do this, I can say with confidence, I don't owe you anything anymore. I don't have to do that because I am free from sin. Thank you, Lord. Good news. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. You know, as we sit here, Heavenly Father, many of us can go over times and places, circumstances, where we, well, for several of us I know, got angry. We weren't, uh, we weren't, we certainly weren't showing the fruit of the Spirit. Some of us at some time or other have looked at things we shouldn't look at. We got ourselves in trouble because that's such addictive behavior. We didn't take advantage of the freedom, the deliverance that there is in the Lord Jesus. So this morning I pray for each one here, and they're talking to you as well, and they're seeking forgiveness, no doubt, but I think they also are asking that you would provide for them the, that consciousness of of what the Holy Spirit is able to do in their lives. They can be free. They are free.
from slavery to sin. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We ask that our week will be glorious because I know that we will have plenty of opportunity to deal with temptation to do different things that do not fulfill the law, uh, the righteousness that's in the law, or rather satisfy the lust of the flesh. We'll have a lot of opportunity to do that. But I pray that in this coming week, we will all experience victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you. Is there any prayer requests yet before we go? Any special prayer requests or do we have them all? Thank you, Dave. We are dismissed.